This is such a big thing, right? <laughs> Come on, Jim. Jim. Good morning, Colin. Morning. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Um, fantastic. Thank you for being on the show today. Thank you for I wanted to be, be kind of business-like. Um, <laughs> Can I see the other guy? <laughs> Hello and welcome to Qatar's first sports podcast, In The Game. I'm your host, Steve Mackey, and we can't wait to introduce you to everything that is sports here in Qatar and afar. We're going to be bringing you personalities, company owners, institutions, individuals that are making a real difference. So, with us, enjoy the journey. It's, it's fun, man. Sports is fun. Everyone, thank you for listening. Please send us your feedback on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. And don't forget to review us on your favorite podcast app. Hello and welcome to In The Game, Qatar's first sports podcast. Today is, I always say it's a special day, but today is an even specialer day, if there could be ever, ever such a thing. But we have the wonderful Julia Simic on the, on, the, um, on the podcast today, and we are privileged for you to come on today. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me, and it's a pleasure to, to talk to you. Yeah. So everybody's saying, so what sport? And and not everybody's going to know what sport you are, but you're into, you're a big star in ladies football. <laughs> if you say so, um, obviously, uh, what can I say, right? I wouldn't say a big star. I think, yeah, I'm, I'm quite a while into football now. I think I have my 17th year, this year of, a uh, of my professional career, basically. And it's been a, it's been a long journey. Yeah. And for, from your perspective, and we've jumped straight in, which is absolutely fantastic. And just for everybody out there, Julia plays for um, Milan AC, which you've only just left and you've joined there from West Ham. I bet that's a bit of a come down going to Italy, right? <laughs> <laughs> if you say so, no. Um, I would say, like, my, my dream was always so. I played 13 years in the German Bundesliga, and then I went to England because I just wanted to experience basically a new culture of football right and I think what's what's better than to go in the home country of football England right and I, I have to say it, Italy is also a crazy football country and a crazy football nation so football is also everywhere here I quite loved it in England already because it was everywhere everyone had their club everyone supported a team and here it's kind of the same doesn't matter where you go they either Inter or AC Milan fans and you always have to figure out from second one if, if they're friends or not. So what's it what, what's it like in in, uh, in Milan now? What What is it like? Did, does, uh, have you already kind of, how long have you been there for one? Um, so I started, um, so the season started in mid of August and I came a bit later than the other girls because I was a bit injured, kept doing my uh, rehab in Germany. So I came early August, and since then I'm here basically. Yeah, I had had a couple of weeks and months in the in the rehab only, and now since four or five weeks I'm back playing and I'm on the pitch now, and I'm um, basically here for yeah what I'm here for, and that's playing football. And so it's it's really I'm enjoying my time here at the moment. Oh, nice one. But it was and I, and I'm okay. Let because I'm going to talk about the West Ham thing very soon because I, I watched some some videos of you, um, which fantastic by the way. Um, can we go back to your story? Your how did this all begin for you when it, from a football perspective? Really early. So I would say when I was five, six years, basically, I started playing football. Uh, I have an older brother, like girls get asked these questions a lot, like, how did you even start playing football? Whereas you would normally not ask a man, right? Because it's just normal for boys to play football. Whereas for girls, it's, I would say, it's still not normal that a young girl falls in love with football. But my story, and I know from a lot of other girls as well, was that kind of laugh from second one. And since I'm, yeah, really young, with six, I joined my first um, boys team. So I started playing with the boys and kept playing with the boys until I was 16. Also due to the fact that there wasn't a lot of infrastructure back then for young girls who wanted to play football, right? Not a lot of clubs had a female team as well, which was maybe also an advantage for me because I kept playing with the boys which was really competitive and I was always really on my had to go to my maximum and perform every single day otherwise you're not accepted and that's that helped me obviously for for the rest of my career that I was yeah educated like this and yeah competing like this from from a young age on 
Did, was it competitive? Was it is competitive? Because you're you're saying that you used to play with the boys first. Did they go easy on you? It, it, in not really. Like the boys weren't really used to play against or with a with a girl, right? So yeah. my teammates accepted me at one point. Obviously, I, I changed a couple of times the team, and really soon I got accepted in every single team. Not from everyone. Not from every parent. There was always a bit of a fight you always had to be better than the boys to earn your place or serve your place in, in the team um, but my opponents basically if I by accident not make someone <laughs> that that was always a revenge foul or kind of a revenge tackle right like they didn't like it obviously and also because of the people around who would laugh or scream or make a big thing out of it whereas I would just play football I wouldn't even think it's something special um, because I, I was used to play against and with boys, whereas they sometimes, I would say, tackled me even harder because I was a girl. So it, it wasn't easy, I would say. No, but but how it, that, that must have given you so much kind of uh, such an advantage um, within the ladies football when you went on and all the things that you've had to face because you've traveled around a little bit. But it is kind of you, you you're kind of must have give you a great grounding. Yeah, definitely. So the step, basically, I was 16 when I joined Bayern Munich. And that's when I came in the first team of Bayern Munich as well. So I played with the under-16 boys. And the next year, I played Bundesliga with the like with adults, with women, basically. And that was a huge step, also psychological. It was also from a social standpoint, because I always, in my head, I, I, I worked like a 15, 16-year-old boy, basically. I was just, football was my world. And all of a sudden you behave different when you're in a senior team, right? And have to behave different as well. Um, but that was kind of a step, I would say, more from a social standpoint than from a football standpoint, because I played on a quite high level with the boys already. So I, I could compete with the, with the women uh, at this time. But obviously playing Bundesliga and a bit of more media attraction, a bit of a more professional environment, different teammates, it was a huge step for me back then. And you say Bayern Munich. It's like, what? What? Okay, start for, first. Your family. Who? What's their team? We, was Bayern Munich their team? No, not really. We are from Nuremberg, so okay. there's uh, FC Nuremberg. Basically, that's our home team. And my my parents and my brother, we're all Nuremberg fans. But Bayern is okay. So don't get me wrong. It was not like I'm going to the biggest rival. It was more like. Bayern sometimes has a bit bad image in Germany because they win everything, right? That's yeah. more like jealousy than really like rivalry, I would say. It, it's it's kind of and and I know I know the um, I don't know if you've ever come across him with Bayern Munich for the for the um, for the men's team is uh, Michael and he's the biggest um, big, biggest Bayern Munich fan. He covers himself with all the scarves. Have you seen him? No. Uh -huh. Might have. Don't remember now. He travels around without a shadow of a doubt. Travels around and um, his he goes to every one of the Bayern Munich um, matches. Um, yep. He's distraught at the moment. Obviously, like all of us are distraught, but that he can't go to the matches. But his journey was five hundred kilometers every Saturday that they were playing at home. Well, yeah, no, uh, to be honest, that's for me. My dad would do exactly the same just with Nuremberg. Like he would not when we were born, but back then in a like. A bit time years ago, he would travel to every single away match from Nuremberg, and then he did the same for me. So, yeah, if you're a fan, you're a fan, right? <laughs> and so, if he's that type of fan, your your career must be absolutely fantastic for him. I would say my dad was, or still is, my biggest, the one who criticized me the most, but also my biggest fan. Like my dad would make sure, even like when I was 14, 15, he would drive me to every single training session, pick me up from the tra training sessions, would feel even quite offended if I said that, like, I'm going with someone else today, because he would come anyway to watch it. <laughs> also with the game, so when I started playing for Bayern, and all of a sudden, like, Bayern Munich is in the south of Germany, obviously, so we would play games, in, and Nuremberg is also in the south, so we, he would travel five, six hours up north to see me playing against Hamburg or Wolfsburg or to be in Potsdam, and would always make a big, big effort to, and also just to show support, but also to, yeah, just stay on my side and support me through through that career, yeah. But what was it like with knowing that your family and your father was in the crowd? Did you always look out for where he was? 
Um, yes, so we kind of uh, kind of had a ritual before every single game. Now we don't do it anymore because I went to England and he couldn't watch every single game. Also now with the pandemic, there are no supporters allowed. But I would always make sure I have to see him when we basically walk on the pitch and stand and like clap to the fans for a second. And I would always look around and got really nervous if I couldn't see him. <laughs> like oh. not panicking, but I, I needed to see him in the crowd because I, I knew he is there. And we always had a little eye contact and he would nod against, to me and would wave. And I would wave back always. And sometimes fans would wave because they thought I'm waving to them, but I just meant to wave my dad. <laughs> and that was always a ritual. And since then, oh, this moment always was important for me to be okay, now I can play. Oh, it, it must it must have been a wonderful feeling. It sounds like you've got a wonderful family. It's it's gone. So I'm going on from there, and we will talk a little bit football. But what was it like then to leave um, leave Germany and go to the UK? Mm, I think it was time for me to be honest. I had a, kind of a long career in Germany, and for me, it was just I felt desperate to see something new. Basically, when you see every single stadium and all these teams you've kept playing against every single season again. I was just, I always had something in me that I wanted to travel as well and use football as a life experience a bit. And as soon as basically my national team career, which was not the biggest and the longest, was over, I was like, okay, I'm leaving Germany now and use football to see other countries, other cultures, learn new languages. I could speak English before, but not perfectly. It's still not perfect, but all right to have a podcast with you. But that was in, in me always. So it was not a big... Like I wasn't homesick, for example, because I was used to travel around in Germany. I was gone from home since I'm 16. So I was more like really taking it as an adventure as well. Um, competitive adventure, obviously, but still wanted to make sure I'm, I'm settling in quite quick and get new friends, get a lot of people to know and yeah, just build something up in another country. So you went to London with yeah. West Ham. Crazy fans, crazy... Yeah. Yeah. What was that like? Was it scary? A little bit scary beforehand? And, and what's it like as a, a ladies footballer going into a new team and trying to establish yourself? Now, for me, it was a great experience. And I think I made the best choice a year before. I could have gone to Arsenal, for example, which obviously is a bit higher in the table, but I wasn't ready to take the step away from Germany. And then when the West Ham offer came, back then I already wanted to go somewhere more south in Europe, already got my... Um, convertible car because I just wanted to have a lot of sun around me and maybe the beach as well but then my beard the coach back then called me and showed me the facilities on FaceTime and I was like okay I have to do this because the facilities and the club was so great like the pitches were obviously it was like Wembley grass right like yeah, yeah. it's quite common like to say if the grass is good it's like Wembley and it was the best grass maybe we are, uh, probably I played on uh, since ever and that obviously convinced me and also got to know the West Ham community a little bit, huge club, huge history. A lot of people would be like, wow, if even Germany, congratulations to that great move. I'm a West Ham fan since I'm... So I got really a lot of positive feedback because people would love West Ham, even in Germany. And to be honest, I've never played in a more, um, like in a more aware cl club in terms of social projects. Like West Ham is great in terms of their social engagement in every single direction. And that made me, yeah, made me really happy that I felt like maybe it's not the club to win every single year title, but it's a club to be also grow socially and personally. And and was it hard to break into the team? It's, was it, because it's like earning respect, right? You've got to go into a team, a new team. You've got to find another 10 um, uh, teammates did you fall out with any was it was it easy going in there or did you would did, did did you have to battle your way in no not at all i would say i've never played in a nicer team before than at west ham and never will probably because we were a bunch of people the weirdest characters as well but from everywhere we had diff 14 different nations in our team so there were a lot of foreigners coming in at the same time and that made it, I think, for every single one of us, a lot easier that we knew, knew we we're all on the same page. We're sitting all in the same boat, basically. And so from, first, from the first day on, we would make sure everyone feels good. And we would make effort to make friends and to socialize and to pick everyone up, not leaving anyone behind. And 
we were, I would say, honestly, it was maybe we were 22 people there and it was 22 friends. And that's something I've never experienced before. And for me, that, that gave me from really from the first days on, I felt home there because the girls would be great and the team would be with a great team spirit. And obviously then you enjoy playing football even more. And, and I saw your emotional, um, when you, you, you put out a press release, I think it was on Twitter, I was watching it. That was emotional, right? You kind of, it was, it was tough for you to make a decision to go to Milan. Yeah, definitely. I was a, a lot injured in my time at, at West Ham. I had some knees, knee struggles, also surgery on my knee. And it was from two years, I maybe played only eight, nine months. And still, I would feel really towards West Ham. And they would always also make a lot of effort that I felt really good during my time when I was injured. So it kind of, we had a big connection or a good connection. And obviously that makes it a lot harder when you then decide you you leave the the club and you leave the country um, and you go somewhere else but at the same time I think it's it's always a place where I could return maybe in a different position um, maybe don't know do something again for West Ham because West Ham still feels like my my team a little bit so I'll keep watching all the games from West Ham I'm still in touch with all the girls so West Ham is still a, a, a big feeling inside of me and now you're in Milan I, I, one thing, I bet you didn't use your soft top back in the UK, right? There wasn't many times you can put the roof down. Uh, <laughs> to be honest, I had a really, really good first summer. So I could have really used my car <laughs> a lot. <laughs> and, and so what's it like now being in Milan? This, is, this sounds like you're going to be going on a modeling career afterwards. <laughs> no, not at all, to be honest. So at the moment, uh, also the weather drops a lot. It's not like the, let's say, Deutsche Vita from the beginning where restaurants were open and you could do a lot and the weather was brilliant. And you obviously can combine this life with football as well. It's not just you taking it not serious. Like football basically is the main priority and the whole focus. But I think it's also important to have a bit of a personal and social life next to the football life. And that's always something I always felt since young age on. If I have something on the side in the city or in the country I play in, I'm playing a better football because I'm just feeling better inside. And when I go to training, when I play football, I enjoy it more. Also when I'm settled in from my personal standpoint. So yeah, obviously with the pandemic at the moment, it's, it's hard to have a great social life and personal life because everything is closed and you can't do a lot. But still, I would try to make the most out of it. Try to speak also to the locals here, make an effort to speak the language, speak to the Italians in our team, which aren't really able to speak a lot of English. English, So you have to learn the language. It makes it good because you're here to learn something, right? Yeah, yeah. So now it's, it's a good time and it's a good t decision, definitely. And it's, it's, you said that you, like with your father, you had a certain kind of, you went through certain things where... Do you do that when you go around to different clubs? Do you go through a certain, um, the certain kind of, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? There's a certain, certain thing. So you, you, like you said, you've got, come to Milan, you've looked at your personal life first so that you're feeling great, so that your football can be at the best it can possibly be. What are those things? Because you, you've not had the, you said you've, you've been injured quite a bit. How do you pick yourself up and how do you get yourself into that mindset when sometimes you must be on your own quite a lot? Yeah, definitely. I think at this time, it helps a lot that you have FaceTime and WhatsApp calls and you can see people, Zoom calls every single day, basically, and you still feel like you're socializing. But yeah, definitely, it's a, it's a, it's a tough time sometimes, especially if you start again from zero. So when I came to England and I started, basically, didn't know anyone in the team. And you start from zero and the first days always feel a bit like, uncomfortable you're not really enjoying maybe going in the dressing room the first time because you don't know anyone and yeah. it's always a bit of a like weird feeling right no one I think likes it and then after a while you feel so settled that you think like oh god how did I even not enjoy it at the beginning and it's a bit the same here so the difference here was I came injured and it never happened to me that I started a adventure a new club career basically injured and that was something really tough so coming in and not being able to train with the girls and 
bond with the coach as well and the staff and everyone would just know you as the injured one. And then on top of this, you can't really communicate with a lot of girls here because you don't even speak the language. And that made it harder than usually, I would say. But at the same time, you know what you're doing it for. And as, as soon as I made my comeback, uh, the first couple of minutes, I thought, wow, I really made it. I'm, I'm back on the pitch, not to the point where I have to cry or my emotions are not under control, but where you feel like everything was wor worth it and you sacrifice a lot, obviously, but then you know what you're doing it for and it, it pays off. Like at the end, when you're back playing, it, it gives you so much pleasure, at least for me, that it was worth it. You're, you're Korean. It's, it's, it's great to hear what you've been through and you said that you used to play because there wasn't women's football back then you used to play with the with the, the men right yeah. um and and you must you've seen a lot of changes within ladies football yeah it's like what's the biggest differences that you've seen um that we can use the facilities which we couldn't use at the beginning for example when i played for bayern the first couple of years we would train somewhere completely else and the boys or men would train and there was maybe still is a thing sometimes in different countries at different clubs but just having the acceptance and the also a bit of respect not just being accepted but also being respected in terms of for example we could only use the in winter when the when there was snow everywhere we had to train on astro turf obviously and we would train maybe at 8 30 p.m because every youth club or every youth team would train uh, before us because the priority was more on the youth teams than on the women's teams, right? So we had yeah. to wait until 8.30 until we could use the pitch. And then we had to share it with the, um, like there's a team called over 35 year old. So it's still like that you don't feel, wow, you know where you're, the, the standing of, of the acceptance basically of the team, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And that always, that, that changed a lot. I think now even at Bayern, Wolfsburg, they have great facilities. Every single club in England has great facilities. That was also my why I made this choice to go to England because the facilities are so great. Like we would share the training ground with the first team at West Ham, which is great because we use the same canteen, we use the same gym, we could use all the same basically machines and pitches and everything they would use, we could use as well. And that's that's something that shows a lot from how important it is for them to run a women's team. And obviously the media side of it, now that young girls can know what they dream of, right? Like they all of a sudden see the Lionesses playing in Wembley in front of 75,000 people. Before I was, when I was young, I didn't even know what my dream was. I, I wanted to become a professional footballer and I saw myself playing in the men's Bundesliga, <laughs> which obviously didn't really, wasn't realistic. But when you're eight years old or something, you just think, yeah, yeah, I'll be, I'll be good enough, maybe, to make it one day to the men's. Women's football has come such a long way to the fact, and I'm not just saying this because I'm interviewing you today. It's, it's, I, I love women's football. I, I think what done it for me was, was it the 2019 World Cup last year, yeah. um, where we come really close to getting into the finals and we got knocked out by the Americans, which I, I dislike them so much. It's untrue. <laughs> they were so, so lucky. But uh -huh. women's football is, is technically it's it's fantastic. It's it's it really has come so far. And I don't know if that's wrong to say that. It's that we just never we weren't we didn't associate with because we didn't see it on TV. Yeah, no, I think it it did come a long journey. So you're not wrong by saying it 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 got so much better. It improved so much. So when I think back, like when I was 16 and started having my first experiences basically in women's football because I also didn't know how it how it's going to be like I didn't see Bundesliga matches on TV that it wasn't visible at all so you don't have an idea of how good the level is how good they are technically tactically physically the thing was what always was really good even back then was the physicality like the girls would make a lot of effort to train to do their runs they in good shape they do a lot of stuff on their own but obviously, even this, let's say, 15 years ago, it's a complete different level. You feel like it's a complete different sport. It's so much quicker. It's so much more technical. It's Now, with better coaches and better education of coaches that come into women's football, it's also tactically a different game, right? So yeah. you can now try to or start to enjoy the women's football game as well, which is great. When you see the World Cup last year, I was there as well and watched some games. 
I watched the opening game, France against South Korea, and it was, I got goosebumps for 10 yeah. minutes at least, because the, it was like, the, the crowd was cheering, and it was, it was like a men's game, basically, and I've never experienced that before, with a women's match, and that was something when I stopped for a second, and I thought, this came a really long way, and now we're in a really good, good um, point. Still not at the end, there's still a lot of potential, but we've come a long way, and I think there's a lot of motivation there to keep going. I've got to say, and going back to the World Cup, I was distraught, absolutely distraught. And that's a good thing, really, because I love the women, the women's game. It was a fantastic feeling. And as you said, goosebumps. And, and if I ever, I would always try to watch a match, the, the England match, or yeah. because it, it is come, it's come such a long way. And I've got no preference now. There is no preference to say, oh, I'm just going to watch the, the, the men's game. That's gone. It's like, <laughs> it, we're, it, you, you're on the same par. And one of the, I'm going to go on to the next ones now because I want to, I, I want to bring all these good memories back with you. So in the beginning, I want just one memory of the clubs that you've been at. So what was the thing that stuck out, even with the young, when you were a young, um, you, a young player? So what was the, the one thing that comes to you right now for each club? <laughs> for each club. Okay, let me start with... Um, I, I remember there was a Champions League semi-final and we play, I played with Turbine Potsdam against Wolfsburg, um, like a German yeah. um, match, basically. And we played the second leg. The first leg was 0-0, zero, zero, so it was everything was possible. And... I also scored the first goal and away, which meant like they had to score twice yeah, already. Yeah. And it was like, I think the, the end result was 4-2 uh, for them. So we lost the game. But I remember <laughs> I was, that was the first time that something like this happened to me. It was like 20,000 supporters or spectators in the, in the stadium. And I was trying to lift someone up from Wolfsburg from the other team. A bit rude. I admit this. It wasn't fair play, but not in a, in a really bad way. I just yeah. tried to help help right and like the whole stadium would boo at me it's not really a positive memory but it is at the same time because it was a feeling of adrenaline I will never forget because if 20,000 people and we're not used to playing like in front of huge crowds like this especially people who make noise right normally they if there are a lot of spectators most of them are just interested in watching it they would be all like supporting Wolfsburg so the whole stadium was against me and for 20 minutes I think these were the best 20 minutes I played in my whole career. <laughs> because I had so much adrenaline. I just wanted to, I was so full of energy and we lost, as I said, but it was still like a great experience, great memory. Even if everyone was against you, it can, don't know, it can free some energy I didn't know before. So it, that was a really, really cool moment. Yeah. <laughs> oh, brilliant. And, and with, with Bayern Munich, because that must have been, you must have had so many memories there. Yeah, definitely. I remember like we, we won at one point the the cup and it was out of nowhere basically because we weren't a top team back then. We would mid table team, like sometimes third, fourth place, and we would make it to the cup final and the cup final would be always in played in a big stadium in Cologne and there were like thirty thousand people there. So like a bit of the FA Cup final right in Wembley where a lot of people come in. It's like a one time event, everyone wanted to join and we made it to the final and we played against the best club back then in Germany was Frankfurt. They had all the national team player and they were a great team, would win everything. And we won this game out of nowhere. That was my first title as well. Uh, oh. And there was always also a really, really good memory, obviously, with a lot of people coming from Munich, traveling there and support us. At least five, six thousand people would come and support us. And there was really cool as well yeah <laughs> and how what I, I i can't even imagine what that's like to win something like that it it's must crazy. how long did the party stay for <laughs> to be honest i remember like everyone like there was a party also a good party but not the pe best party ever because i remember everyone was just so exhausted it was <laughs> i think it was until two or three a.m and then every, everything was done everyone would went to bed and we would we would make sure we have two or three other days to party. So we would come home. We had a nice little um, event with Bayern as well. They would also appreciate winning, like the women team winning the um, uh, cup. 
So they would make a little event for us, also a little party, and we would have some good parties after this, but not only at the same day. So it would take maybe a week or something until all. Oh, that must have been so tough. It <laughs> must have been so short. Hard tough. week, hard week, yeah. And and when you went to West Ham, what was the were the were the high with the highlight that you had there? I would say also the FA Cup final. So in the first season, we made it to the FA Cup final and played in in Wembley against Man City. We lost that game, unfortunately, but. Even for us, like for Germans, like Wembley plays a, it's a big thing, you know, not of only course. for British people, but also for us because Wembley is the home of football a little bit. Everyone would know Wembley and making it to Wembley, also being in the dressing room and being active, not just as a supporter, a spectator or something. Um, that was something outstanding and also, yeah, just also just a warm up. Like everything was unreal. Then I think there were 43,000 people <sighs> there watching the game and. Oh, really, really how do you deal with how do you deal with those emotions? Um, I think that's really overwhelming, especially for women, if they because our daily business is not playing in front of full stadiums. Like we would normally play in front of one thousand up to five thousand spectators. So if you all of a sudden play in big stadiums in front of forty thousand, where you can't really communicate anymore, men are used to this because they do it every week. But we're not used to this, so it changes a lot. I remember, like we were also training before that week, and, and training had a session where no one could communicate, so everyone would just be quiet and couldn't like shout for the ball just to train a bit the the situation. And it's basically like you can't even hear your own word, so it's hard to give each other like a little bit of commandos or something and yeah. it's cool it's still good like it's every, everyone's dreaming of events like this or matches like this oh dear and and it's kind of i i, I can't imagine i can't i just can't but it's lovely because I, I what i try to do with with the guests is i try to try to in try to think about what it must have been like but that to go out on wembley is as you said from an english even an english person's pers perspective oh that must have been amazing and the yeah. turf must have been like carpet. Yeah, but to be honest, when you train every single, like, I remember my first couple of sessions at West Ham and I came from Germany and I would say the pitches are still good there, but not at English level, right? So a, a, a green keeper would not have the same standing in Germany as he has in, in, in England. And the pitches and at the training already were great. I would be always like, wow, the pitch is so great, no? To the video. <laughs> and he would be like, mm, a bit bumpy. And I was like, how can you even complain about this pitch for me? It's perfect. So, but still um, comparing it to, to Wembley, it's a difference. Like Wembley is maybe the best pitch I've ever touched. <laughs> and to 40,000 cheering people. It must have been, oh my word, I can, I, I'm getting goose pimples now. It's just, <laughs> it's just amazing. Um, with, with women's football, you've been, you've, been, you've been a role model for so many then. You've been at, from the very beginning. You've been one of those ambassadors for the women's game. How does and, that feel? Yeah, that's something I... Obviously, I think when you have a long career like this and you play in different clubs and you have something to tell or something to give, you just have some experience, right? So at the moment, what I started last summer was um, creating like a football academy. Like a, I started with girls' camps and it's basically only for girls. Um, just to give another opportunity even especially in Germany where girls football is still not that great infrastructure that every single girl just can say ah oh, there's a local club next to my house I can just start playing there only with girls because a lot of young girls might not be like me or other girls at the beginning where they would be comfortable with the boys they either play with girls or they leave leave it you know and I want them to still have the opportunity to choose am I playing and if yes do I play with the girls or do I play with the boys but if there's no girls, so maybe there's no opportunity for them. So I started to create like a football school. And that's something where I want to give back a little bit from everything I experienced. And also, yeah, what inspired me, I want to be maybe the person that inspires young, young girls to start playing and maybe be the reason for some of them to keep playing or continue playing or dreaming of something like a big career in football because I always felt like football is a privilege for me. Like it's not, never felt like I would never say I, I go to my job now or I, that's my job. It's just a hobby and it's lucky me, my, my profession for 
16 years. And that's something I'm really, really grateful for. And that's why I think a lot of other girls, and even if it's not as a professional footballer, there are a lot of opportunities for girls now to work in sports and especially in football. So why not creating a passion for a sport like football, giving them all the attributes through playing in a team and that they can use for their social life as well or for their for other careers and that's something football taught me and this is something I want to give a bit to the yeah, next generation. I was going to ask you the question how do you keep yourself motivated? <laughs> you, I, I, I've, I've just got the answer. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? <laughs> it? You're just giving back so much it's not just about you playing football anymore right it's it's yeah, kind of definitely. you it, you throw yourself into other people's kind of and that's what I, I i suppose that's what i try to do is is when you got when the motivation comes from helping others and yourself yeah. at the same time yeah. it, it's the best feeling so when i did a camp which is exhausting because i basically organize everything on my own and get the kid from wherever and get the kids in and everything and have people there to help and then you're exhausted and then the kids would leave it and they would all smile and be chatty and make new friends as well. So it creates friendships as well. And that's why I always think like, oh, that's, that's really worth it. Like it's something I'm, I'm definitely passionate about. And also where I see myself, maybe even after my active years of playing, where I would be like, I would never leave football as a, as an area for me, because I have so much still to, to do or to give in, in football. I it, one of those one of those questions that I was going to come on to, which was was um, what are you going to do after? Fo I know that you still got a long time, and there's loads of things <laughs> that you're going to achieve in football right now. It's like, but it, it's like I'm so it's lovely to hear from because you, you're you're, and I, I'm sorry to say this, there, there could be a hundred and one things that you could go off and do right now, but it's so, with your spirit and the way that you've gone through this football thing, it's such a such a relief that you're going to stay in football. Uh, definitely for me it's it's not even a question if I'm leaving football or not yeah maybe I leave it one day as a as a player but I will never leave it completely and I think it's I don't know I think it's something where I feel privileged again that I found something in my life where I feel so passionate about right not everyone has this this one thing that basically make you get out of bed in the morning and that's for me it's football it doesn't matter if I'm um training myself or if i'm training others it's it's both not exactly the same obviously i think there's no better feeling than playing and scoring and winning a game and being in the team and being in the dressing room but also what i experience is giving something to others and also don't know training kids for example they would soak everything like out of you basically and that's something really nice as well if you feel like i really have something to give and this is where i could say one day the one day where i quit or retire i'm still in a good yeah shape i would say because i know there's something waiting for me it's i, I know that a lot of girls and men as well maybe struggle with this leaving the career because you defined yourself as a football player since 20 30 years maybe right and then you have to start a new life but knowing that there's something basically you have i have one foot already in the door for my future a little bit gives me a bit of, yeah, where I feel a bit more relaxed with the day. And it will come that I have to retire, but also knowing there's something I'm still passionate about. You've got so much ele electricity. You've got so much passion and drive. And it's like, a, it's infectious. And and you you just can't get out of the game because you've got so much to give. And and it goes oh, on to my it. next question, which is, which is how important are role models in the game? And who was your role models? That's something I think that changed as well. It's like I always had male role models. So I would always aim to play like Figo or Sidan or like this Iniesta, Xavi. That was a bit my, my generation. Um, and I, I love these kind of players to watch because that was the only option or the only chance I could watch football was men football, right? And I would say young girls that switch on the TV, for example, and see... For example, the Lioness is playing or the German national team or even here in Italy, they show the national t uh, team matches. It's great because young girls can be like, don't know, all of a sudden recognizing players. They, they've seen them in the, in the TV and all of a sudden they've seen them maybe somewhere in a pizza shop or a restaurant or at the shop or wherever, right? And they all of a sudden know, ah, this is, I want to 
aim to play like her one day and not like him because that's not oh, possible. Right? Yes, yes. And that's something great. I think that's so good that women's football is visible now. Not enough still, in my opinion, but at least to the point where if you make effort, you find the matches, you can see the matches, you can stream the matches and you can yeah, basically dream of something. And that's, that's really important to have female role models, I would say. And do you know something? It's the, the half an hour has flown by. You yeah. are incredible. And it's I'm like you are going to be that role model to so many. And it, I, I wish you every success in Milan. I hope you score those goals. I hope you show them exactly what you've learned over all those years. You're Thank an you. inspiration. And I, I'm, I'm privileged to have had this interview with you today. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much for having me. Oh, second. thank you. Uh, and, and good luck with the season. Good luck with the, the game. I hope you win many, many more trophies. You deserve it. And, and, and please keep on being that role model because you are, you are without a doubt, a role model to so many women. Thank you so much. It was a big pleasure, really. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. And don't change your smile. Whatever you do, don't change that smile and keep on smiling. Good on you. <laughs> thank you thank you everybody for thank listening you. i hope you enjoyed it as much as i did because that was just amazing thank you again julia thank you again thank you so much everyone thank you for listening please send us your feedback on facebook instagram or twitter and don't forget to review us on your favorite podcast app